you're on. Good evening and welcome to our web webinar tonight at Crossroads Career Network. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Tom Jacobson. Our webinar format is similar each time. So if you're new, I will inform you of all the services that are available through MN Crossroads. And if you're attending before or you've attended before, thank you for bearing with me. On a volunteer basis, I lead the Crossroads out of Woodbury Lutheran Church in Woodbury. Uh, and if you didn't know, we have three um, Crossroads locations throughout the Twin Cities. Uh, and however, lately or for the, almost a year now, we've been doing all of our seminars uh, via online service and services online. I'm looking forward to hearing our speakers today. Um, they're going to be great. And I hope you will leave pumped up to conquer your job search mission when we're all done tonight. I'll give you an overview of what's to come through Crossroads, but first I'd like to share this with you. Um, Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There are so many areas where this would be great for today. And if we were filled with hope, our job search would be more fruitful. Our attitudes would uh, would be more and our, towards our circumstances would be more positive and we would be with God's love. In these days, having the hope of God and the power of the Holy Spirit with us will give us the strength we need to conquer um, our what we're dealing with and uh, what's ahead of us and beyond in this COVID crisis and stay focused on our job search. Let me uh, quickly open us with a prayer and then I'll give you an overview of what's ahead in Crossroads this month. Lord, thank you for bringing us together tonight through the power of Zoom and the internet. Help us focus on the wisdom that is going to be shared by Christina and Natalie tonight. Give us the focus to be, form great questions and to stay focused on the little things that may make a difference in our, helping our, with our skills and help us perform better in our job search. Allow us to be successful and to find the things that we are looking for uh, our career and then help us through our lives and, and give us the power to be successful each day uh, at just being a great human being. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So let's, uh, let's get started on some of these slides. If I can just get my mouse to find the screen here. Give me a second. Okay. Day has been a trap. Just one second. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Oh, where, why is that up? Having a few minor deal difficulties here. Excuse me. Welcome to Crossroads Career Network. So these are the, this is the agenda for tonight. Um, from seven to seven fifteen, I'll be doing a welcome induction and crossroad overview. Crossroad. And the slides are not up. They're not up. Hmm. Wonder. Oh, Just give me a second. I'm having all sorts of difficulties with this mouse tonight. There we go. Oh, you know why they're not up? I forgot to share them. Because of this system. Hmm. Well, let me just say that the agenda is uh, we're from 7 to 7.15, I'll be doing the welcome overview. And then uh, we'll have uh, a speaker uh, do their crossroads um, story and their career. And then uh, the main speaker will be Natalie, who will come on and do uh, her wow interviewers with your, your superstar stories. 
why won't that go away? Bear with me, I'm getting closer, getting them shared. And there. Um, so wow interviews with your star stories and then wrap up at uh, 8.25. Sorry for the issues tonight. Um, our three locations that I alluded to earlier are the uh, Minnesota Crossroads Career Network in Eden Prairie out of Grace Church. Uh, as I said, I lead the group out of the Woodbury Lutheran Church. And then there's a third location in Arden Hills through the North Heights uh, Lutheran Church. Um, and all these locations are obviously we're meeting uh, virtually now, but uh, hopefully this summer or uh, this fall we'll be back in in session at all these locations with on-site meetings and services as I'll discuss now. Um, you can check out everything we offer uh, on our website at uh, mncrossroads.com. It's a full service website. It has uh, all the things that I'm going to talk about, but you can, it's really um, well laid out and easy to navigate. And I highly recommend you check it out. It has a lot of great uh, things out there to take care uh, that will help you in your job search and your transition. Some things that we do on a weekly basis uh, on every Thursday, we have uh, networking with Grace that is led by Wes Tang and Wes Roper. Uh, you can sign up for that meeting online and uh, on our website and or find instructions on how to sign up on our website and uh, it's done virtually, it's run very efficiently, and it has helped a lot of people on connecting throughout the Twin Cities or wherever they're looking to connect through with companies that are available or have positions available or don't have positions you're just looking to network into. So check that out, uh, Networking with Grace with the two S's. It's a, a fantastic way to help get you in the door at some of the companies that, uh, that you may be targeting. We also have one-on-one -on -one coaching available online. Uh, you can sign up. Uh, there's availability almost uh, all the time and uh, sign up and check out what's available uh, through uh, our online coaching program. We have lots of volunteers that are out there uh, that will help you uh, with you know, interviewing and uh, your resume, any uh, number of the things that go into the job search. <clears throat> So if you really need help on a consistent day and you're looking for prayer support, we have a whole group that does that. Uh, you can look, uh, find that online uh, and fill out a request for a prayer and uh, uh, someone will get back in touch with you uh, that they're going to be doing a prayer, working on praying for you uh, in your job search. And that may turn the corner and give you the support you need to be successful. Uh, we have online classes and uh, one of the things that uh, we feel is the meat and potatoes of, of Crossroads is uh, our eight week courses. And those eight week courses are designed to have something each week uh, as part of the job search that's going to really make a difference in your, the way you attack and work your job search in a way that is gonna help you be successful. So uh, for, when, for instance, the first week, uh, one of the things that we look at and is do assessments on our attitude. How do, you, how do you change and look at your attitude so you can be successful? Sometimes our attitude is such that it's not conducive to being successful. And by finding that out and really looking at and focusing on it, we can become uh, that much more um, in tune with what we need to do to be successful every day. Assessments, like I said, are about, you know, what are you really good at? And how do you focus on that? And how do you turn those into stories that you can tell during your interview? Um, that uh, is part of it. Uh, networking. How do I network? I mean, we have networking meetings, but what do I do on a consistent? How do I do it? What do, how do I target? Who are the things that? So targeting companies. How do I write a resume? What, what resumes are needed for uh, searching for different types of jobs or different types of comp uh, industries, those types of things. So our resumes are, we focus on resumes in these classes. Interviewing, how to be successful at interviewing, how to target those interviews and really be, uh, you know, practice and make sure that you're well-tuned uh, so that when you do get interviews, you knock them out of the park. Um, negotiating, you know, the, the idea of just getting a job uh, is appealing, but 
sometimes it takes real negotiation to get the little components to your job so that you, it is the job of your dreams and it can be you can thrive in it so you know negotiating can be a big part of what we do and once we do get selected for it and then selecting companies so from end to end it is one uh the classes really gives you all the fundamentals uh, to a job search and really can build your confidence and some of the components are some accountability i mean we had a lot of people that in these where that'll team up and they'll hold each other accountable or the group will be accountable uh, agent so it's that's very and then encouragement i mean through this job search it's a lonely it can be a lonely and stressful uh, part of your life and having the encouragement of the group can be very uh, uplifting and really make a difference in your life so um I highly recommend that you look at uh, our Zoom, uh, our, our eight week course on via Zoom right now, uh, and hopefully not too far in the future uh, in person. So, um, and it includes exploration of God's perspective and how to look at it from a spiritual standpoint. And I think that can be really enlightening and very helpful to a lot of people. So we have new classes beginning each month. Um, so check out the website. Uh, like I said, they're online there. You can find out how to sign up and who the instructors are and what time they meet and where they are uh, you know, from a um, time of day. So um, check that out. I think you'll find that, that that'll really uh, kickstart your, your job search and your transition. Um, another thing that we have available is our on LinkedIn group. Uh, and there's about uh, you know, 2000 people that are associated with this LinkedIn group. Sign up online, you can type into the search bar MN Crossroads Career Network, and it'll pop up, uh, and it'll let, you can figure out how to join, and you'll have access into those 2,000 people who have all gone through job search and may, and are willing to help uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, there also be um, information on there, tips, all sorts of things, uh, meetings. So give that a shot. Check out, check that out, and see what's available out there. You might find uh, your next job right there. We might have a posting out there, or something that you could find that would be help you be successful. So check out our our LinkedIn group. And if uh, if you like, or if you heard about a webinar that we did and you didn't get to attend, and you'd like to check it out, we have those available online too on our uh, on our website. So check that out. Uh, there's a uh, you can navigate to it, see which ones you uh, want to uh, look at and uh, check them out. Or you really like this one and you want to go back and you want to find some of the notes that or some of the things that you didn't get in your notes, you can rewatch it online uh, through our YouTube channel on uh, with our webinars on it. So give that a try. We can't do this without volunteers. And this is a, a cross section of some of the volunteers that have done uh, and helped uh, so uh, there's a lot of people up there. Um, there's three of us on there from that are on tonight. Um, so, but this is just a small uh, portion. Uh, there are many more and we're always looking for new volunteers. So um, you know anybody or you wanna volunteer, uh, you can always uh, seek that out through the website too and contact one of us, so. Now, we have a webinar coming up on March the 19th, uh, which I believe is Friday. Um, it's a $149 value, and we're giving a sponsorship for one free. Uh, it's, um, it's done by George Murray, and uh, he's uh, also an author and, uh, and businessman or person here in the Twin Cities, and he uh, is offering these seminars, uh, and they'll be at the Minneapolis College. And you, can, can win this or uh, receive this scholarship uh, by registering to win at uh, info at mncrossroads.com. Uh, just send an email there and uh, um, the first one to uh, go will take and who signs up and uh, you will announce it today uh, at the end of the uh, workshop. So, or the seminar tonight, who, who's actually uh, is going to go. So uh, if you're interested, uh, get your email in now. So, And if you're looking for a church home, uh, visit one of our churches uh, on Sunday morning, uh, now streaming online. Uh, you can go uh, to woodburylutheran.org 
uh, North Heights Church uh, or Grace Church and uh, check those out and find out the schedule and see uh, if you, yeah, you uh, might want to consider them as a church home after the, uh, we're done streaming and they're actually, we're back to in-person services. So uh, that's a, a bit of an overview of Crossroads. Uh, and I uh, hope uh, uh, the technical difficulties didn't make it uh, unbearable. Um, but uh, it, uh, it, there is a lot to offer uh, through Crossroads and uh, um and it's it can really uh there's a lot of things out there so i i uh, want you to go out and check that out if you can and uh so uh now i'd like to introduce you to our uh, uh career crossroads um speaker tonight who is christina wright uh i've known christina uh for a uh, number of years uh and uh, I, I think you're going to enjoy hearing her speak. She's uh, an eloquent communicator and uh, she works, uh, she recently uh, took a position with Thrivent uh, and uh, she works in corporate communications. And I'm going to turn it over to her now because she tells her story a whole lot better than I do. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, I appreciate you inviting me. Um, I'm really excited to be here and just be able to share a little bit about myself and, and my job transition, transition journey. Um, just by way of introduction, as Tom mentioned, um, I've spent nearly 20 years in corporate communications, uh, so a majority of my career, uh, really working in the financial services industry uh, within credit unions. Um, for the first 14 years, I was at the, the local trade association for Minnesota credit unions and then uh, was recruited away by a local credit union and really they created a position for me on their senior leadership team. Um, and it was a new role, uh, so I was given a lot of autonomy and flexibility to kind of create it as I went, and I got to do some really great work. Um, but over time I, I turned into a bit of a utility player. Um, I had a, a nebulous title that didn't really describe what I was doing, and I, I really started driving for more, for more clarity in my role. And as we worked toward that, um, I was starting to realize that the direction that my role was shaping up really wasn't appealing to me. It, it didn't really use my communication skills, um, so I made the, the tough decision to leave, uh, to leave a good organization and a, a steady paycheck and stability. Um, but I was also choosing to leave an environment where I never quite felt like I fit in for whatever reason. Um, but it just, it wasn't something I hadn't, I had ever experienced before. So it was really strange to me. Um, and after operating in that kind of place for the better part of five years, I, I knew it was time for me to move on. Um, and I truly believe that kind of throughout my career, the Lord had drawn me there to that place for a reason. And I learned a lot, I grew a lot, and I developed a lot while I was there, but it was, it was time uh, for me to, to, to move on to something new. Um, I felt very fortunate in my departure to get a severance. Um, so I left feeling apprehensive, but optimistic. Um, I had some internal things to, to work through and to figure out. Um, I really needed some time to process like what didn't work about the role I was in and, and really how can I learn from it and move forward. And I found myself in, in a place where I, many of you I'm sure feel that same way, like, ah, what's next? Um, I didn't quite know, but I also felt a tremendous weight lifted off of my shoulders. Um, and I really felt like the Lord had brought me to that time and place for a specific purpose. Um, and so in the time that I was out of work, I, I really had the opportunity to, to focus on my family and to spend some quality time with my husband and my kids. Um, and that's time that had suffered a little bit in recent years, you know, due to my role. Um, and it just, it allowed me the time to work through the process of what am I really good at? You know, when I, when I feel alive in my work, what am I doing? Um, and so those of you who haven't kind of gone through that introspective process, I encourage you to ask yourself those questions and really kind of dig into um, what it is that lights you up and, and makes you feel alive in your work. Um, so this was August of 2019, so pre-pandemic. Um, and I honestly felt pretty confident that I would land well. Um, 
that it would, it might take a, a little while, it might take a few months or whatever, but I, I was feeling optimistic about the future. Um, so I took a couple months to really just be, to do some of that internal processing that I mentioned. You know, I was monitoring job boards and kind of um, honing in on um, what I actually wanted to do. I'd read a job description and I'd think, ooh, that sounds good, but I don't want that part. And so it allowed me to really um, hone in on what I wanted to do. Um, and then in, in late October, I, I took a trip to Ireland with my 86 year old grandma. Um, and when I returned in November, um, that's really when I started to, to get serious about my job search. Um, and so that was the time when I joined Crossroads and began, began to expand my network. Um, and I really felt like I was making some great headway kind of out of the gate. I was a finalist for a role in November. I had some really great opportunities in front of me in January and February, and then the pandemic hit. Um, and so for me, that was a time when I realized that connection was more important than ever. Um, and, and so during that time, I, I started my own networking group um, where we had weekly connections. It was a lot of folks from Minnesota Crossroads or from Easter or White Box, folks I had met you know, along the way in my journey um, that I felt a, a connection with, I felt were good eggs, were gonna land well um, and, and were you know, going to get snapped up um, by some employer in the near future. Um, I, we like to think that we were doing you know, virtual networking before virtual networking was cool. <laughs> before that's all we could do. Um, but for me, it was a really good opportunity. Um, and I think for the rest of the group to get acquainted with video chat and explore and, and get comfortable with those, these newer tools um, that a lot of us hadn't been using in our daily um, jobs. So in addition to that group that I facilitated, I also joined a few other groups, um, a professional communications association. I volunteered my time to be able to showcase my abilities. And then I really followed the advice that others had given me about making 10 to 15 one-to-one -one personal networking connections every week. So for me, I, I felt like I really needed to treat my job search like a full-time job. Uh, I heard somebody say once, you gotta work at it like it's all up to you, but then put your faith in God knowing that it's really all up to him. Um, but my continual prayer during my job search was that the Lord would close the doors he wanted to close and open the doors that he wanted to open. Um, and that was really important grounding for me during my search. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, if you've been in job transition for any length of time, it's really a roller coaster. You go from hot to cold um, and it can be a continual battle to stay, stay positive and keep moving forward, even if it's just small steps at a time. So during my 13 months in transition, I was a finalist for four roles at four different companies. And yeah, when you become emotionally invested in a process or in a job, it's, it's definitely disappointing to make it to the final round and then not be selected. But that was a door that the Lord closed. And thinking back on my prayer, I needed to be thankful that he was answering my prayer. He was making it pretty clear. <laughs> he was closing doors. And, you know, looking back, I'm just, I'm so grateful for some of the doors that he closed. Um, many of which were, you know, roles that felt so right. But now in hindsight, I can look back and see, you know, many of those same companies going through massive layoffs. Um, one of the hiring managers that I was interviewing with and, and talking to, um, you know, as, as recently as August got laid off in November. Um, and so I, I just think about, you know, if I had started a job and then gotten laid off a month later, I don't think I would be in a, in a better, you know, position for that. So um, I, I really ended up being grateful for those closed doors. Um, certainly I took my time to throw my pity party and, and maybe mourn the loss of something I thought was going to, was going to be. Um, but, you know, looking back over my time of transition, I can see how I was able to kind of get over it and move forward faster and faster each time. And I really feel like it was, you know, my faith and, and dependence on the Lord that pulled me through. Um, one of the verses I, uh, clung to during this time is, is Isaiah 55, eight, and the Lord says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts and my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. Um, you know, his, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our, our, our ways are. 
And I like the comparison of like a parent to a child. So when you have, have kids, you know, your kids want to eat candy for lunch and for dinner. Yet as the parent, <laughs> I'm not going to let you do that. And then the kid throws a tantrum. And it's kind of like that with God too. I might want something really bad and not understand why he won't give it to me, but he knows better and he has a plan and I just need to trust it. So, I mean, honestly, my personal journey, I felt so close to the Lord during this time. Um, I had a lot more mental clarity. I had more time to pray and journal and to get deeper into the word and read devotionals. Um, a great opportunity for me was, was to be able to incorporate faith into my weekly networking group. Um, and I felt like that became such an important outlet and connection point for me, really to, to share my faith and to tell others about what the Lord was speaking to me, um, which was so often words of you know encouragement and hope. And really it became like a ministry to me. To the point that on my third rejection as a finalist, one of my first thoughts was that, you know, my work in this new ministry in my job transition group, that my work wasn't done yet and that he still had more for me to do in that place and in that season. Um, it, it just kind of rem reminded me of, of uh, what Esther says um, in her book of the Bible that perhaps the Lord has placed me here for such a time as this. Um, so as Tom mentioned, I landed at Thrivent uh, just this past November, and I started December 14th. So I'm closing in on that three-month mark, uh, but I'm working in internal communications at a Fortune 500 company. And I mean, truly, I, am, I, I feel like I'm doing exactly what I set out to do. I'm using communications to create clarity and translating strategy into action, working on change communications and organizational messaging and positioning and really helping to build transparency and trust and employee engagement within the company. So all in all, you know, my search was a 13 month journey, um, way longer than I would have expected, but I'm just so grateful for it. Um, for the time I had to really be free and to be with my family and to embrace, you know, the gift that the Lord was giving to me. Um, I think the last thing I want to mention, I'm especially grateful to Minnesota Crossroads, um, which was the first place that I had started when I uh, began networking back in November of 2019. Um, but really, Crossroads gave me a shift in mindset um, around networking in that it's not networking doesn't have to be schmoozy and slick, but it really is the focus on how can I help others and that for me was a game changer um, when it came to networking. So I will leave you with a verse from 2 Corinthians that relates to that um, chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. God is our merciful father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others and when they're troubled we'll be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. So that's my story. Thanks so much for allowing me to share it, Tom. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, Christine. I, I, uh, I got to share in uh, some of your journey and uh, I know uh, uh, how focused you were and how goal oriented you were and how much uh, the spiritual component really made a difference in how you approached it and really focused on things. And uh, you were always strong throughout and, uh, and uh, you never showed that weakness if you had any. So I... Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I thought you were a great leader, and I think you're going to make a great uh, leader at Thriving. So thank you for thanks. joining us tonight, sharing your story. I you're think welcome. it's a wonderful story. So. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce. I'm sorry, Tom, I accidentally muted you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? You're fine now. So okay, thanks. good. So um, let me go start over. I'm here to introduce Natalie Ackerman, who's the CEO of uh, Talent Edge Group. Uh, she's a certified uh, career coach and has uh, over 10 years of experience helping people be successful, at least more successful. Uh, she, she knows her stuff and, uh, and uh, she's helped thousands of people become more confident and clear about their value. And she's going to share a little bit of that uh, with you tonight. And if you have questions along the way, please use our chat function to type them in. 
uh, we'll ch check in with it uh, periodically and uh, she'll answer those questions for you. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll get everything you need out of this to be successful in your transition and be able to hit the ground running tomorrow. So it's all yours, Natalie. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you, Tom, for the work that you do for Crossroads in Woodbury. There was just a definite need for the eastern side of the Twin Cities to have a job transition group. And you have filled that gap and done it well. And just thank you so much. Christina, thank you for your testimony. It's hard to follow that act. How do you follow somebody who is like this amazing communicator? But I just, you know, some of the things I picked up from you, Christina, that you said were just, I loved how you kept track of your numbers. And that's really important because if, how, how do you know if you're winning if you don't know what the score is? So, but you took some time to clarify and reflect. You spent time with family. And I always tell people in my Crossroads groups, by the way, I've been part of the Crossroads team since 2009. So I am one of the small group leaders and, uh, you know, workshop presenters. And so when we meet in person at the all day workshops, I'm frequently there presenting. And so anyway, but Christina, I always tell people that this is just a wonderful chance to step back and evaluate your relationships, spend time with those people that you haven't for a while. And I can't tell you how many stories I've heard about people who were able to be with dying parents or uh, you know, reconnecting with family members. So good for you that you took that step back and you reevaluated, got clear on what you wanted to do. And, you know, when I coach people, I know that's one of the hardest people or one of the hardest things for people to do is really clarify where they're going and what their strengths are. And so um, you're right. This, this job search journey can be very challenging, but it can be very rewarding. And I love how you were focusing on how you could serve others. And that right there is just a really, really important uh, piece of information for all of us is that if we put our focus on how can we help others, then you know it makes the journey more purposeful and joyful um, because we're not just so focused on my problems and all the challenges that I'm facing. So thanks for bringing that to light today. Um, as I mentioned, I've been with the Crossroads team for uh, since 2009, what is that, 11 years now? Holy cow, time flies by. And I was the recipient of uh, help from Crossroads because I went through one of their small groups and it was life-changing for me. I, I don't know how I could have done it without, without this. So anyway, hopefully I can live up to all that Tom introduced of me and, and bring some real value today. I can tell you, we're going to talk about how to do uh, wow interviews. And so today I'm not going to talk about how do you answer specific questions, but I'm going to help you understand the mindset that you need to have going into the interview, what you can expect, how to prepare. And uh, I would love your questions along the way. So um, with that, I'm going to share my screen and uh, share my presentation. All right, and I really wish I could be there in person with all of you and see your faces. I'm telling you, I'm still not used to technology and uh, I'm really looking forward to the day when we can be in person and um, meet some of you. So anyway, but how to wow interviewers. So I like to start out with a little bit of humor and I found these cartoons and I think, thought they were kind of cute. So we know that companies in COVID some of them have really had some struggles and, and their revenues have dipped. And I thought this was kind of funny. Here is this man interviewing a, a woman and he says, well, we're looking for people who can help make this company profitable again. I'll read your resume for $500. And then the other one, how many of you have ever had that impromptu call from a recruiter and you're in the grocery store and you've got your kids with you and you haven't really, you know, you don't remember your background, you're not prepared. And so I love how this says, I tattooed my resume to my body just in case I get an impromptu job interview. So now I'm sure none of you are gonna go out there and do that, but I just thought it was kind of funny. And you know what? It's important to be able to laugh in this journey because um, I always, you know, like Christina, you said, this is really a roller coaster. And that is so true. 
a uh, job search is not for wimps. It's hard work. And, um, you know, I think about the, the old Olympic slogan, if any of you are big watchers of the Olympics, and it goes like this. It's the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And sometimes you will have five opportunities brewing. You've had two interviews with companies. You're just like, they're your dream companies. And then the next week, they all fall apart. And I've talked to so many people where that's happened. And so um, it really is a roller coaster. And um, so hopefully today this will be helpful to you and give you some tips that'll be immediately actionable. So I always say that, you know, you've made it now. So your resume is really your sales sheet. It's just, it's, it's what gets you in the door to have the conversation. It's not what gets you the job. It's the interview that gets you the job. And so you've made it through that applicant tracking system gauntlet. And it is, it is a gauntlet. There are over 200 applicant tracking systems out there. And good grief, how do you know what they're, you know, how to get through them all, right? Um, one uh, tip, and you know what, Tom or Harry, could I have you write this in the chat uh, for people? Is jobscan.co, if you've not heard of that tool, it's a great resource where you can do a side-by-side -side comparison of your resume with the job description, and it will measure what percentage of job um, or keyword match. And if you're 80% or higher, it'll show green and anything below that is yellow. And so it shows you exactly what words they're looking for and how you can sprinkle those into your resume. Um, it's a wonderful resource. So. Anyway, but you've now, you've made it through this gauntlet. Yay, woohoo! I got the interview, so excited. Well, now it's your time to shine. This is not your time to be modest. It's your time to toot your horn. And, you know, I hear so many people say, I hate tooting my horn. I hate having to brag and talk about myself. Well, you know what? If I was your 80-year-old grandmother, I'd tap you on the face and say, Oh, you know, little Susie, you're just going to have to get over it because you know what? You have you're you're competing against some really qualified candidates. So, it's not your time to be modest. Toot your horn. And if this helps you any, if it's a fact, if it's a real measurable result that you've had, an accomplishment, then it's not bragging. It's just stating a fact. So, if that helps anybody out there, um, I'm very happy about that. All right, so interviewing really is a sales process. So guess what? You're a salesperson, whether you like it or not. But the only difference is that you are the product. So you're not selling widgets or a car, you're selling you. So for all of you who say, oh, I hate that, I'm not a salesperson. Well, you know what, you are. Whether you realize it or not, every time that you try to win somebody to uh, an idea, that you have, or you're trying to present uh, a new product or a new service within your company, just because you're in sales right now in your job process, it doesn't stop when you get into your job. So I think there might be some questions here. I'm seeing some chat pop up and I will try to be watchful of that. Um, but anyway, as I go through this and then I'll take those questions, um, so you're the product. All right, let's see. Let's see what's going on at the chat. If anything urgent has come up here. All right, thank you. I think we're good. Um, so it really is a consultative sales call. All right, which which has three parts. One is that you want to uncover their needs by asking open-ended questions. How can you solve a problem if you're not aware of what the problem is? And we know that a company doesn't just put a, you know, post for a position that they don't really need. There's a reason why they have it posted. They want you to solve problems, right? So this is your chance to learn what those problems are. And then you're going to match your experience with their needs. So through your star stories. I remember once I bought a pair of shoes. I was going to do some training in Las Vegas for a client. Um, and I went to buy some shoes. And, and the man who was helping me, 
he was so determined to sell me the shoe that he wanted for me. I don't know if he was making a big commission on that shoe. I have no idea. But for whatever reason, he wanted me to have that shoe. Well, I bought that shoe, went to Las Vegas, was there for the weekend, and my feet, I, I had to take my shoes off for most of the time because I couldn't walk. They were awful. So I put them back to the store, and the sales um, person that I got the second time around, she started asking me some questions, and she asked, you know, well, tell me about when you're training. You know, where are you training, and are you standing the whole time? Are you sitting at some times, and what do you like about the shoes that you have? And, and she was just asking a lot of questions to uncover my needs. And then she matched the right pair of shoes to match my needs. And I, it was a great experience. And so you as a candidate being interviewed, the more that you can demonstrate that you really are there to try to um, help them solve their problems, the more you're gonna stand out and wow the interviewer. So. The third step in the process is to close the sale. How many of you who are in sales out there, if you didn't close a sale, you'd be um, in the poorhouse pretty fast. You have to learn how to do that. So ask for the job if you want the job. Now I'll say if it's a job that you're not interested in, then don't do that. Just say thank you, politely leave the, the interview. But if it's a job that you're interested in, then you definitely want to say, you know, Bob, I really appreciate your time and for sharing more about this position. I'm really impressed by what I've heard and I'm looking forward to learning more. I'm excited about this opportunity. And then you can ask, you know, what are the next steps or, or when are you going to be making a decision? But you've got to ask for the job. All right. And show that you can quickly contribute value and profit to the organization. So you've probably heard it said, you've got to have metrics. You have to be able to measure it. Tell me, you know, dollars, cents, percentages, and all of that. And for some of you, that's not possible. I know like in training, in that profession, you know, it's hard to measure what impact you had. Or there are some other ones that you might might not be able to, to give those um, measurable accomplishments, or so you think. So I like to tell the story about a um, front desk receptionist who was in one of my Crossroads small groups. And she said, well, I'm just the front desk receptionist. I don't have any measurable uh, accomplishments. And I said, well, let's think about it for a minute. You're the master of first impressions, right? You're the first voice they hear on the phone. You're the per first person that they see when they walk in the door. You're the one that is really creating that first impression for a company. So right there, that is winning. You know, if you think about maybe a, a job candidate who's really, you know, that they're, the company's trying to woo, that's their first impression of your company. Or a potential customer who's calling on the phone. And that's the first um, impression they have of your company. Well, what happens if you're grouchy that day, having a bad day, and now you're a little bit grouchy on the phone? What are they thinking? They might be thinking, well, is everybody this unhappy? What's the culture like here? Is it really bad? You know, is this going to be a hard company to work with or work for? So everyone makes, uh, has a business impact. But then I said, let's take it another step. And then let's look at, well, how many phone calls did you take every day? Oh, hundreds. Okay, well then there's one measurable um, metric that you can use. How many people walked through the door every day that you greeted or that came to your desk with questions? Start taking account of that. So there you go, you can add those numbers in. So everyone has those measurable accomplishments if you just dig for them. So what does that look like? Well, you have to shift your thinking from what you do and to what happens when you do it or because you do it. Why buy ROI or return on investment? Meaning, you know, that company is gonna pay you 60, 80, 100, whatever thousand dollars a year, you know they want a return on their investment. And so why should they buy you? What, what return are you going to give them? And that why buy ROI says, I know what you need. I can do it because you know what, I've done it before and I'm gonna tell you the stories about that. And so I can prove that I can do it. 
And then, you know what? I can do it again. I can do it for you and I can get up to speed pretty quickly. And so if you kind of think through that dynamic a little bit, it's very empowering for you. And telling your stories, you know, I talk to a lot of people in job transition and it doesn't matter what level they're at. You could be entry level all the way up to the C-suite, the CEO. Job search is the great level leveler. You know, it's, um, it's a very vulnerable place to be. And, you know, you have to show up and be your best self every day. And that's hard. And sometimes you don't even believe in it or believe in you. And I love star stories because I don't know of anything else that's more empowering and confidence building than when you draft up your star stories, because these are the stories that you, these are your accomplishments. No one else did this, you did this. And so as you recount and go through your database of all those great uh, accomplishments, you know, you start to feel like, hmm, I really did do a lot. I forgot about that. And it's very empowering. So if you haven't already started, uh, you know, drafting up your star stories, I just, you know, I hope after today, well, you're going to have to because most interviewers are now using this technique in interviews. So create your database. And, you know, the hardest part is to get started. Um, if you are new to interviewing and you haven't had to tell those stories, then it's gonna be harder getting started, but once you do, then it, you get into the flow. So how will you be evaluated in that interview? So 50%, so half of that decision is being made on whether you're a good culture fit. The number one reason for failure in a job is bad culture fit. So what is culture fit, right? It's a two-way street, um, social fit. Are you somebody uh, you know, who's very quiet and introverted in a culture that's very loud and, and boisterous? I remember uh, I interviewed once with a very, very prestigious company and I thought, oh, wow, if I could work for this company, this would be amazing, amazing on my resume, right? And um, I am a very outgoing, loud, gregarious person for those who know me in person and that you could hear a pin drop in the hallway there. It was, and I just thought I would never fit here. I'd be like a bull in a china shop. So, you know, other things like shared values. If you value your family first and you want work-life balance, but this is a hard charge and we, you know what? We just do whatever it takes to get the job done. And if that means you gotta be here till midnight, then that's what we expect. Well, that's not going to be a good value fit either side. Um, do you have leadership ability if they're looking for that? And what is your attitude, right? Um, maybe you really value continuous learning and that's really important to you. Well, you're going to want to ask some questions to uncover where they stand on that. Are they putting, are they investing in their employees? And if they're not, and that's important to you, then you know that's not going to be a good culture fit for you, right? <clears throat> 30% of the job or how you're evaluated is an, on your competence and ability. So can you actually do the job? Do you have the technical fit, expertise, education, et cetera? And then the remaining 20% is your willingness and enthusiasm. So how will you do the job? How are you gonna show up every day? And are you going to love the job? Do you have ambition? Um, do, you, do you have, are you motivated? Are you a high energy person? Are you a team player? Are you adaptable or are you more, you know, I just want the, I wanna do my job and, and then leave and, and go home for the day, right? They're, they're evaluating you on all of these things. And it is a two way street, right? Some of the key questions that you're, you know, and actually before I do that, I'm going to pause for just a minute and check the chat. Um, you'd think we'd all be so techno savvy already after a year of this. And so I'm still maneuvering my way through, but um, from Kevin, most of my positions have been entry level, parcel drivers, et cetera. Like you said, some measurable accomplishments sometimes are not possible. And then I think about it, let's say clean driving record, on-time delivery, savings in not having accidents, 
being courteous to delivery customers meeting their needs. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin, for that input. Everyone has those um, measurable uh, outcomes for sure. Thank you for that. So some key questions that that interviewer is asking in their mind. And by the way, for those of you who manage people and you've had to uh, interview candidates for, for jobs, you know better than anybody, you want this process to be over as soon as possible because you've already got a full-time job and now you have to add to it all the interviews and the time that it takes to do that. So they're secretly hoping that you're the candidate. Um, you know, they want you to be the candidate that's right for this, uh, for the opportunity. So again, can you do the job? So literally, do you have the goods to do it? Do you understand the job? Um, I'll never forget, I interviewed for a job once and she asked me, well, why, you know, why are you interested in this job? And I, and it was a virtual interview. So I fortunately had the job description in front of me and I kind of reiterated back some of the key points. And, you know, this is what is most interesting to me. They want to know, do you really understand the job? But she said to me, oh, is that what the job posting said? And this is the hiring manager. And I thought this is, <laughs> well, that's a clue. Number one about, you know, that tells me about the company. Um, but she said, oh, I'm going to have to talk to my recruiter. Well, do you understand the job? And how many of you have found some of these job postings, either they give you way too much information and, and it's overwhelming, or they don't give you enough information and you just have no clue. What, what are they looking for here? So they may be probing to see if you really understand the job, not only from their job posting, but do you really have a firm grasp on what this job requires because you've got that much experience? Um, can we afford you? Big question, right? That, that's always, you know, many times it's a deal breaker. Will you be happy here? And do you want the job? So uh, they don't want you to be unhappy from day one because Turnover costs companies billions of dollars a year. It's extremely costly. It's like twenty-five to fifty thousand uh, dollars to hire somebody new for the cost of turnover, and that goes much higher when you're talking about executive positions. So they really want to make sure that you want the job. So how should you pre prepare for that interview? I'm gonna talk about just kind of overall, but I'm also gonna talk about best practices in video interviewing because that is really the way probably 99% of interviews are happening right now. So first and very, very important is your mindset. So I encourage people to go into an interview thinking like you're the CEO of your company. And as the CEO, you're a consultant and you're being hired to solve problems and you're there to serve your customer. And so, you know, having that mindset, I'm the CEO or I'm a consultant and I'm here to serve you. I want to find out how I can be helpful to you and, and solve some of the challenges and help you grow. If you come across with that mindset, I guarantee you, you're going to stand above the competition. These people are very kind of robotically answering the questions that they think they, the interviewer wants to hear. So the person who really genuinely wants to partner up with these people in solving these problems is going to stand out. But caveat there is you're not, your job is not to go in and tell them you know, how messed up they are and man, their process is really broken. That's not the point. So it's about how you can partner with them. Learn about the job. There are a lot of ways you can learn about the job. And if we were in person, I would be asking you for ideas because I know that all of you have great wisdom about this. But what I've heard is, well, one, look on LinkedIn, find somebody at the company that you can talk to and ask them if maybe they know about that position, if they work in that department, get a referral into the company. Um, you know, look on Glassdoor, indeed.com, all those sites for similar jobs, because again, that job posting may not be very good. 
sometimes they're not well written. So finding another job posting that has a little bit different language can be helpful. Um, you know, look for other people on LinkedIn with that job and find out what do they do. Uh, so there's a lot, you know, talk to people who are in that industry. And so there's a lot of ways to learn about the job. Research the company. Um, you know, nowadays there's no excuse not to do that. We have the internet. Look on the company website, do a very thorough scour over that site. And I'm talking thorough, right? You want to look at everything. What's the news about the company? What new products have they launched? Um, what's, you know, what's being reported about them? What does their career site say? That tells you a lot about their culture, what they value most. Certainly you want to know what the mission, vision, values are of the company. Sometimes you have to dig a little deeper for some companies, right? Um, so the internet provides lots of resources and then the local library. If you have a library card, you have access to their online portal and you can research all kinds of things, right? Google, Google the company. Um, prepare questions. Again, I recommend, you know what, Google is my best friend. I'm always Googling stuff, but go out and do, you know, what are the best questions to ask in an interview? And you're gonna find so much information. The two reasons why, uh, that are the two things that recruiters say uh, are big um, reasons or knocks against candidates is that they haven't done their homework, they don't know anything about the company or the job, and they don't have any questions. And I'll never forget there was um, a, a head of HR who was, she actually uh, used to do some of the Crossroads workshops, but she said, um, you know, there was a team of people interviewing this candidate, and she was the first one. And the person was very sharp, she was impressed, they came with questions. And so then the next, you know, four or five people they interviewed with, this person felt like they got all their questions answered. And so they didn't ask any questions. Well, what frequently happens when you're working, you know, doing team interviews is that they will join together and talk about the candidate. And so when this group was sharing about this person, the first person said, oh, I thought he was really sharp and he asked some really great questions. And everybody else said, he didn't ask any questions of me. And so, you know, what does that signify to somebody if you don't ask questions? It means I'm not really that interested, right? Or I don't really understand the job. So make sure that you have some good questions. Uh, and I'm, oops, I'm gonna stay there for just a second. And when you do your research, you know, Google, what are the best questions to ask in an interview? What I recommend is that you prepare kind of a master document, a uh, Word doc, where you've copied and pasted all those questions into kind of your database of questions. And then for each interview, you copy and paste and select the ones that are gonna be most appropriate for that interview, that company. And you know, the questions that you're gonna be asking for, for the screening interview are gonna be much different than when you're in the second or third round of interviews. So make sure that you've got your little cheat sheet of questions that's customized for that specific interview. Bring extra resumes, portfolio, brag book, personality profile. I know that, you know, when we get back to in-person interviewing, if they really do that much of it, um, sometimes that person interviewing you, they may forget to print it out or they bring extra people with them. And so it's very thoughtful for you to bring extras. Now, you know, with online, they can print their own. But if any of you are in professions like, you know, architects or creative people, marketing people, where you have a portfolio of some of the work that you've done, um, you know what, you can do screen share and bring that up on screen in that virtual interview. Brag book, some of the case studies, um, you know, work that you've done. Personality profile, if you have taken StrengthsFinder, DISC or any of those, I, you know what, I always recommend that people have like a, a one page quick reference guide that gives some key uh, background about that person's strengths. And, you know, that's a great leave behind after the interview when you say thank you is to just say, you know what, I thought maybe this would be helpful for you to understand my personality a little bit more, right? 
All right, so dress the part. Now we're doing interviewing virtually. And, you know, it's very funny. We all laugh about how, yeah, I've got my yoga pants, my sweatpants on on the bottom, and I've got a suit and tie up top. Well, you know what? Wear pants. I'm even wearing pants tonight. I don't have, well, okay, let me step back. I'm wearing dress pants, I should say. Um, goodness grief, if I wasn't wearing pants, that would not be good. But, you know, I am wearing dress pants. I'm actually dressed fully in a professional outfit um, because you know what? How many times have you had a, a, one of your children come in the room, your dog, your cat comes in the room and you're like, excuse me, and you know, you have to get up. Um, I had that happen the other day where somebody had a new puppy and she bent over and she put her backside to the camera and you know, to pick up the puppy and it wasn't a pretty view. And so <laughs> I would just say, dress the part, okay? Don't wear really bright clothes. Try if you're wearing a tie. Now that's a whole other question that people have is should I wear a tie? Shouldn't I wear a tie? And that's, you know, we can address that in our question section, but dress the part, okay? And if you have any questions about the culture and, and that, um, you can ask the recruiter, you know, what's, what's the dress code there? What do you recommend I, I wear in this interview? It's okay to ask them that. But I will say you only have one chance to make a good first impression. And so wouldn't you rather dress up than down for that initial um, you know, conversation? Arrive early. Yep, even arrive early for uh, the virtual interviews. Make sure your technology works. We'll talk about that in a minute. Practice, practice, practice. Three times. How many of you know when you say it three times, it's really important. So if any of you have been on a sports team, you know that you can't win the championship if you don't practice. So you are in the championship round. You've Remember, you've made it through this ATS gauntlet, and now this is your time to win the championship. So you're not going to win it if you don't practice. I am a big fan of practice in the mirror with a timer and do it many, many times until you feel like you've just got this. Now, you don't need to memorize it, but if you keep practicing so many times, it will become embedded in you. And then what happens is for the interview, then you come across more confident and you also come across more authentic because you're not trying to read an answer or you know a script. Um, so, be the most prepared, and you can control that. They say that for every interview, you should put in a minimum of 10 hours of preparation time. But Harry, maybe you even have some other statistics. It could even be 25 hours. Between you know, researching and everything else, be the most prepared, the most passionate, and the most qualified candidate. I'm going to pause. I can see that. Oopsie. I'm going to see. I can see there's some chat. Quick reference guide, what should be in that? Um, you know what, if anybody wants to know more about that, send me an email and if you know your top five strengths, I have a quick reference guide or you can just take some of the summaries of um, different you know, reports that you've received in those um, personality profiles, pick out those things that you think are gonna be most relevant to that job. Steve, very good point. You don't get a second chance to make a first impression. It's so true. So practice, prepare. Okay, good feedback. Thank you, everybody. Most common interview mistakes, uh, not researching the company, we talked about that, and not being prepared and not having any questions. Big, big oops, being late, Talking or looking at your phone. Well, it's sad to have to even say the obvious, but I can't tell you how many recruiters I talk to who say you would not believe how many people bring their phone to an interview and take calls. And to me, I'm thinking, I can't even imagine that. But for sure, put it on do not disturb. Unless, now caveat to that, if you have a family member un undergoing surgery and you need to you know, be alert 
for anything that might happen or something urgent and pressing like that, then absolutely let that recruiter know and just say, normally I would not have my phone on, but here's the situation, right? <laughs> Slamming past employers. You may have an employer who did you so wrong. You're really bitter, really angry. Man, you could do a lawsuit. Uh, they really have it coming to them. Just do not slam them because it's a very, very small world and you don't know who knows who. So keep it professional, keep it polite and positive. Um, don't do that. Uh, using we before I, you know what? They're not hiring we the team, they're hiring you. Now, if you have an example where it was a team effort, you can say our team, or I was a part of a team that was tasked with but my part was X, Y, and Z. And then talking about money too early. Now, in that screening interview, that person is being paid to find out the two big questions. Can you do the job and can we afford you? And they're going to get very irritated if you try some, you know, fancy technique that you heard about to try to, um, avoid that question now, but the key is that you don't want to give all the goods up front. You don't want to give them all the specifics, give them ranges. And so you can go 10 to 20%. It depends on, you know, the higher your income, the larger that range can go. But hopefully you've done your homework. You can go to glassdoor.com, salary.com, onetonline.com, some great resources. Harry or Tom, if you could put those in the chat for everybody, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, do your homework and find out kind of those ranges. And you have to know what your range is before you even start the conversation. So uh, you've got to know three numbers. One is, what's my gotta have? This is the bottom line. I gotta have this and nothing lower. If I get this, I'm barely making it, but you know, for this opportunity, I would take this. My wanna have is this would be a really solid number. And um, I could take the family on vacation once a year and this would be great. And my love to have, and that is, man, dream come true. I can retire early, take the family to Europe, you know? Um, what's that range for you? And then test that against what you're learning in your research against what is that salary range out there? What's the market range? Um, and then, whoops, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Harry, for putting those. So we've got a question from Alan. Relative to the salary question, I've also started asking if they have established a budget for uh, the role. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. You can ask, do you have an established range for this position? Um, you know, you might say something like, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to answer that question, but I don't have, you know, I don't feel like I have all the information on this position. I want to better understand what the responsibilities are. Do you have an established budget or a range for this position? And many times they will tell you, um, and then you can say, or if you give a range, then you can follow that up and just say, is that within your budgeted range? Okay. Um, Jay, are neatly trimmed beards acceptable in an interview or is it best to shave it off? I am not an expert on that. I know beards are a big, big thing with men these days. So, um, well, if you're over 50 and you're trying to look like a millennial, then wear a beard. But no, I'm just kidding. So uh, I don't know. Harry and Tom, if you have any input into that, I'm always of the thought that it's better to shave it off um, for the interview because you want to put your best foot forward. And if any of you are millennials out there, I hope I didn't offend you. So um, just a little friendly humor there. Great question. Okay, some video interview best practices. Well, first find a quiet place where it's well lit, free from interruptions and clutter, okay? 
So, um, and let your family know and everybody around you know, the door is gonna be closed. I can't have any interruptions, okay? Ensure that your internet connection is stable. So a minimum of one megabyte bandwidth. Test your computer's webcam and audio. So do that earlier in the day. Position the camera so that you're looking up slightly and centered on the screen. So if you have to prop that, you know, your computer up. Right now I have four books that are sitting, my computer sitting on so that I can appear that I'm looking straight at the screen. And hopefully it does look that way. Um, but you know, it's uh, if you can look into the camera, um, you know, rather than looking down at their face, that's the best practice. Close any other web browser tabs or applications that you have open because they might have pop-ups, they'd be distracting. Um, ask the interviewer for their phone number if they haven't given it to you because if you lose that connection, then you can get back on, okay? Some other best practices for video interviewing, put your phone on silent mode, dress professionally and avoid bright colors and patterns. I think I did a faux pas tonight because I'm wearing a polka dotted uh, top, but I got spring fever and I thought I need to wear something happy. And I'm the presenter, so I get to do that. Um, clear your desk, accept a pen, notepad, and a copy of your resume and your questions. Listen, nod, and smile to show that you're paying attention. That's really important to remember that. Be upbeat, keep good posture. So make sure that you uh, sit straight up as the interview starts. Okay. Now, these are some standard questions that you're gonna be asked, and then we're gonna talk about star interviewing. So tell me about yourself. That's going to come in some fashion or form. It's going to be walk me through your history, walk me through your resume, tell me about yourself. That's almost always the very first question you're going to hear. My experience is that if you can nail that, then you're going to have more confidence going into the rest of the interview. If you are unsteady on how to answer that and not really prepared, then that's gonna set the stage for the rest of the interview. And I've got a great formula for how to respond to that, okay? Tell me about yourself should be one minute, one and a half minutes tops. If you're going 30 seconds, you're probably not telling enough. If you're going two minutes, you're probably going, you're telling way too much. This is not them asking you for your entire career history. This is tell me about yourself in parentheses or brackets, as it relates to this position, they have spent painstaking efforts to write this job description. They've given you their wish list. And so they want to hear that you, you know, have all that they want on their wish list. Um, I'll pause there and just say, before you get too intimidated, um, Nobody fulfills every wish on the wish list. So if you look at a position and you say, oh, I don't have all that, then you know what? Go for it anyway. Let them screen you out. The only exception to that is if they say something is required. You have to have a CPA required, a master's is required. That would be the exception. But if they say it's preferred, I say go for it and let them screen you out. Don't you screen yourself out. Why did you leave your current or last job? Well, for most of you, that's a pretty easy cut and dried one. You know what? My job was impacted by COVID. What are your strengths and weaknesses? Um, you know what? I would say tie that right back to what they're asking for in the position. And that question can come in different forms. It could be, what would your former boss say that your strengths are? Or, how would a former colleague describe you, right? And then oh, with the weakness question, um, it's really important to know, don't say something that's gonna shoot yourself in the foot. You know, if you're an accountant and you say, well, there was that one time that I missed that million dollar journal entry, don't do that, right? But give them something that is 
fairly needy. I mean, because what they're looking for there is they want to know, one, can you admit that you have a weakness? Because we all do. And if you try to say something like, well, I can't think of anything, well, then they're going to say this person isn't real and they don't have high EQ. They don't know themselves. They're in denial, <laughs> right? Um, but you want to point to something that, you know, is um, just a, a weakness and how you overcame it. That's what they really want to know. So here's something about me. Hey, you know what? Sometimes I can get buried in the weeds on things, but what I've learned to do is look up and, um, you know, look at the bigger picture or I get carried, you know, I can get really uh, into a project and lose track of time. What I've learned to do is that I set a timer. The standard answers that most people give on that is, oh, I'm such a workaholic. Well, they've heard that. They've all heard it a thousand times. Don't give them that. Give them something meaningful. What attracted you to this job? They want to know, do you want this job? Or are you just applying for anything and everything because you're desperate and you need a job? So you better be able to say, and again, feed back to them some of the components of the job that you read in the job description, just say, you know, I love that this job is going to enable me to, uh, you know, do customer service or whatever it is. Why do you want to work for our company? Well, this is your chance to pay them a compliment and show them that you did your homework. So you've scoured their website. You found out that they won the best workplace for women award, right? You're a woman interviewing for the position. So you just tell them, you know, in my research, I discovered that you won the best workplace award. I am, you know, first of all, congratulations. But second of all, as a woman, I am just, I love working for, for extremely um, successful companies. And I would be honored to work for a company that won that award, that prestigious award. All right, let's, oops, ah, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Bad facilitator here. All right, again, you'd think that we would have this down one year into this. I was trying to get to the chat and, um, all right. Rebecca says, I was caught off guard when I had given my intro or of self and they said, please go through your resume. Ah, okay. Um, well, certainly you need to know your resume and be prepared if that's the case. I don't, you know, I don't hear that frequently that they want to go line by line, but you definitely have to know your resume. Okay. And then finally, why should we hire you? This again goes back to that job posting. They've told you exactly what they want. You've listened through the interviewing process and you've learned what their struggles, their pain points are. And now you're feeding that right back to them and saying, I can do this because you know I've been listening and I heard what you said and I can do all these things that you have asked for and I can demonstrate that. So now um, I'm gonna give you a formula for telling me about yourself. There's probably a lot of great information out there but I found this one to be simple and very um, straightforward. So one is to highlight your past experiences and your proven success. So I've been in the X industry or doing X role for the last X years. And I'll give you a sample example in a minute. Most recently I've been, one reason I enjoy this role or this industry is the opportunity to, and then you're gonna pull something out of that job description that it's very clear and evident that it's very important to them. And then lastly, you're gonna say in my last job, I, and then you give a result and tie it to what that, uh, the previous question about what you enjoyed about the role. So something very succinct. Your strengths and abilities. So one of my greatest strengths is, and then again, tie it to the job description. If they've told you that they want somebody who's great at leading cross-functional teams or building relationships or, client retention, client management, um, you know, whatever. Um, give a short example or a brief detail. And then conclude with a statement about your current situation. What I'm looking for now is, and then obviously not the reason you're looking, but something related to the company that you're interviewing with or a challenge that they've told you about. 
So here's what that might look like. I've been in customer service for the past five years. My most recent experience has been handling incoming calls in the high-tech industry. One reason I particularly enjoy this business and the challenges that go along with it is the opportunity to connect with people. In my last job, I formed some significant customer relationships resulting in a 30% increase in sales in a matter of months. So they're giving some very specific information, a real result, they're tying it to something important in that job description. My real strength is my attention to detail. I pride myself on my reputation for following through and meeting deadlines. When I commit to doing something, I make sure it gets done and on time. What I'm looking for now is a company that values customer relations where I can join a strong team and have a positive impact on customer retention and sales. I know if you're like me, when in the past, when I've interviewed for positions, this was the toughest um, question for me to work through because, you know, there's so much of your background to filter through and then you've got the job description and you're trying to pull it all together and it can be three minutes or five minutes long before you know it. And so I think this formula is very impactful it's tying right to that job description. And you'll have a chance to get this because I'll send it to you after the workshop. Okay, so now let's talk about STAR. It could be called PAR, CAR. You might hear it by many names. We're gonna talk about it as STAR. And so this is behavioral interviewing. If you have not yet had a behavioral interview, then you will at some point because this is becoming kind of the standard. There are still some kind of standard questions that I went through earlier that they will ask, but the majority of the interview is going to be questions about, tell me about a time when. So they want to know a real life situation. Because why? The best predictor of future performance is past performance in similar situations. They don't want to know a hypothetically, well, Bob, what would you do if you were in this situation? And then Bob might say, well, I think I would. They wanna know what did you actually do because they learn a lot by you telling that story. They learn how you solve problems. They learn how you communicate, your teamwork, decision-making, um, communication. They learn all kinds of things from that, that story. So the formula is tell me the situation, task or objective, actions, results. So if we dig a little deeper into this, then, you know, they want to know, and this is contextual information, where did this happen? When did it happen? They might be thinking, well, why was this important? What was the goal? What was the initial scope of the project? What were the challenges? These are some of the things that you want to be thinking through as you're drafting up your stories. What were the risks and the potential consequences if nothing happened? So in other words, what was the business impact? Like, you know, every problem um, what I see happen with people in interviewing is they don't give enough context as to what the problem was. They just launch into what they did and what the result was. Well, you're missing a really important component of that story, which is why did you even have to do that task in the first place? There was some kind of problem that needed to be solved, or it could have been there was an opportunity that was being missed. And so somebody needed to do something about that. Actions. So what did you personally own? How did you do it? Who else was involved? Were you the key driver or the project owner? Was there, uh, what was your biggest contribution? If it was a team um, success story, what unique value did you bring to that? What were the most significant obstacles that you faced and how did you overcome them? What did you do specifically versus the team? How did you set priorities? How did you deal with XYZ problem or get your manager's buy-in? These are some of these follow-ups that they might ask you to the initial questions. So you might wanna be thinking through these as you're preparing your stories. What decisions did you challenge if you, if you did and why? How did you influence the right outcome? 
By the way, these probing questions came from a friend of mine who sent this to me recently. He interviewed with Amazon and these are, Amazon is known for being, their interview process is very, very rigorous. And so I wanna thank him. Chad, if you're on the call tonight, thank you for this. But um, that's where this information came from. And they will ask these questions. So now what about the results that you achieved? How did you measure success for this project? What results did you achieve? Did you have a cost savings or did you generate new revenue? Um, can you quantify that with volume, size, scale, or a percentage change year over year with improvements? Did you impact time to market? You know, if you're in product development, well, you know that time to market's everything. You gotta beat the competition to the market. So that's a huge metric. Implementation time, um, time savings. You made something more efficient and the impact on the customer or the team. You know, back to this time savings, um, you know, sometimes when I'm coaching people for interview preparation, uh, we look at, you know, as you keep asking, well, why was that important? What was so significant about that? When you say time savings, well, what does that mean? And somebody will say, well, you know, it used to take 10 hours to do this process and now it takes five. Well, and I don't know how much money I saved. Well, if you can kind of back into it and say, well, who were the people that worked on it? What would be their average hourly rate or salary and then break that down to an hourly rate well how much how much money in just that resource uh, salary or payment did you save well we saved 100 hours a month okay well if the average person makes 30 dollars an hour well that's 30 that's three thousand dollars a month and then you factor that into a year that's thirty six thousand dollars a year so you can be creative and you can find some meaningful numbers. One thing I see with people on resumes, a lot of salespeople will put a lot of percentages. And you know, I, I would say, encourage you to see if you can move beyond that and not use, overuse that um, and give some real numbers uh, if possible, dollars and cents, that kind of thing. Because sometimes, and sometimes you can't do that because sometimes, the percentage was really, you know, if you worked for a really small company or that result was, you know, $5,000, well, maybe that was a 80% increase year over year. And you don't want to say, well, it was just $5,000. You know, that doesn't sound big enough. So then in that case, you would use percentage, right? And then any quality improvements. If any of you are in the manufacturing industry, how did that impact quality? All right. Um, and then, you know, some other probing questions would be what what would you have what would have been your backup plan? They may ask that as a follow up question. What would you have done had that not worked? I don't know if anybody's been asked that question before, but you could have that. What trade offs did you have to make to achieve it in quality, cost or time? I mean, these are all helpful questions for you thinking through these stories and preparing. What were the lessons that you learned and what would you have done differently? I've heard people get asked that quite a bit. And how would you improve the process or result today? How would you implement this at XYZ company? All right. So when we talk about your return on investment, again, they're going to pay you 60, 80, 100, whatever thousand a year. They want a return on their investment. How many of you have a 401k? You expect a return. So how have you helped your employer make money? save money or time, make work easier, solve a problem, become more competitive. So, you know, maybe you came up with a pro new product idea and that enabled the company to be more competitive. Strengthen the relationships or the image with customers, vendors, or the public. How many of you know that it takes more effort to win a new customer than it does to keep an existing customer? The stats on that, the, the numbers on that are astronomical. So what if you're just a just superstar relationship person and you saved this account that was, you know, they were threatening to pull their business out and you saved it because you were so savvy in your relationship building skills. Well, you have just um, strengthened that relationship, right? Or let's say you're a great customer service person 
and you just are, you know, you're on the front lines and people, I had a really great experience with a company recently and I went, wow, I'm so impressed. I had a deep, you know, a defunct product and they didn't just send me one replacement. They sent me two. You think I'm going to go back and, and do more business with that company? You bet I am. Expand the normal scope of business. I tell the story about how, um, ah, I'm running out of time, but maybe some of you have expanded that scope of business because you're just looking for opportunities and you're aware of them. You brought in new customers, you retained customers. So um, there, here's an example. And for the sake of time, I know that my time is short. If you do um, send or ask me request the documents at the end, I'm going to give you an opportunity. This story is in that. And so they may ask you some of these questions. And that, again, is in the document that you um, I'm, I'm glad to send, send your way. So in following up with people, send a thank you note. Do you need to send an email or a handwritten note? Yes or yes. I mean, what's most important is that you send a thank you note. Only 25% of people actually send thank you notes, which is, you know, what does that mean? You have a, a competitive advantage over 75% of the candidates just by sending an email note. And it's so easy. Send it within 24 hours. I don't know any recruiter or hiring manager that looks negatively on getting both. If anything, it might give you an advantage. If you don't hear back by the agreed upon date, call or email reminding them of your interest and seek to serve them. So see if there's anything that you can do to be of help to them and be mindful, have kind of a, a helpful attitude that I know your schedule must be so busy right now. And um, you know, how can I be of help or, or is there anything I can provide for you that would make this process easier? Be pleasantly persistent and follow up once a week for seven weeks and then let it go. I know it's annoying when these people don't get back to you and boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could force their hand and make them get back to you. But um, make notes about what you did well and what you need to improve on. Keep networking, filling your pipeline. You could have 10 opportunities brewing right now. All 10 could go away. And if you don't have people in your network, you're gonna be depressed and you're gonna go into a pit. But if you have activity, then you're just gonna be like brushing it off and okay, I'm moving on. Um, I wanted to share this thank you note. And again, uh, this is in the documents that if you request them, this is here. There are two samples of thank you notes that um, are just really good. The, the bottom line is with your thank you note, you want to demonstrate that you were listening in that interview and that you you want to feed back to them something specific that you heard them say and so that's always complimentary and also something very specific about the job that you're excited about maybe a problem they shared with you that needs to be solved okay and why you're a great candidate for that position it's a two-way street the choice to hire is the interviewers but the choice to accept is yours so it has to be a good fit for both of you. Don't override your gut instinct if you're feeling like, I can't tell you how many people I talk to that say, I did that and it was the worst decision of my life. Um, so, okay. All right, so I have a question. The PowerPoint, Harry, I think that's gonna be posted on the Crossroads website. So you will have access to that. Yeah, Alan, a common interview question I get is how would you attack your first 90 days in this role? Yeah, what coaching would you have for this question? Have you ever seen a 60, 90 day, 30, 60, 90 day plan? Um, Google that and there are lots of great examples. That's right for some positions and not for others, but uh, it's just a proactive way. And I would say don't offer that until you've gone through at least two interviews. It can be uh, too early, it can be preliminary. And um, all right, so um, lastly, what I would encourage you to do is for all the documents I mentioned, can uh, I'd like to have you go to my website. I just updated it. I'm trying to kind of 
automate things. So if you wouldn't mind going to my website, you can certainly email me. Um, but if you're an executive, you manage people and you're looking for professional development, I have a, a program that's paid through the Dislocated Worker Program. So please ask me about that. And I would love to connect with you. So there's multiple ways, but for sure, LinkedIn and or email. So anyway, thank you for your time. I hope to meet all of you in person someday and I wish you every success in your job search. Thank you so much. Tom, you're hey, thank you, Natalie. It was a pleasure having you on tonight. I really, uh, I got a lot of value out of your presentation. There's a lot of great things there. And especially that um, I've used the 30, 60, 90 and, and uh, had that prepared. And that's, that's come in handy many times, uh, especially depending upon your position. I mean, it can be really, really important. Um, thank you to all our contributors today. Uh, Christina, uh, who did a great job with her transition story. Natalie, the presentation was spot on and great information. I think we all learned something tonight. Uh, thank you uh, all for watching and being here tonight. You'll receive an email tomorrow with links to many of the things we talked about. The recording of the webinar is, uh, is on, like I said, on our YouTube channel there on the website. You can access it. Uh, remember to look uh, if you're in, interested in the eight-week course, which uh, if you're in transition, I think you should be. Uh, we have one starting on uh, March the 15th. I don't think it's closed. Um, so check it out on the way, website, please um, get it and get signed up because it can be the difference maker in your job search. Networking every Thursday with Wes and Wes, uh, and there's one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching help available. Next Thursday, the 18th, uh, starting at uh, 7.30 in the morning, we have a webinar with uh, David Maggi, uh, who is going to be talking about how, to, how you can never get a second chance to make a first impression. David is a great, uh, has done great uh, uh, webinars for us in the past and uh, has is a leader in the industry, the recruitment industry for many years. So uh, tune into that if you can, uh, Thursday morning, March 18th. Um, that's a great seminar and you'll get a lot out of it. Um, you know, best wishes on your search, uh, you know, have a productive next couple of weeks in your efforts and results. Hopefully you'll land a position and that you've been praying for. And, uh, and we'll see you at the next seminar if you need to get your batteries charged and keep going strong in your job search and your transition period. So good night, everyone, and have a great weekend.